it's it's nice to be talking football again. And I've had a chance to to think a lot about what I might share today and kind of give a a glimpse of what I've been thinking about and the perspective that um, I've gained or garnered over the past year. And and really, it almost feels like from the time that I was doing this a year ago, it feels like a new job with um, more education, more knowledge, more clarification on exactly where we are, why we're there, and what we're going to do about it. And the plan is really clear and hasn't changed much from the beginning other than there are some um, felt needs that are clearer based on the timetable that um, that um, I expect our program to have success in. And so the best way that I might uh, frame, and I'm thinking about the right words to, to, to share with this, is that um, in looking back at the class that I spoke to you a year about, a year ago about, um, the way that I would frame that class now was a transitional class, meaning that um, while I um, honored the scholarships of all those players, I wasn't the, the coach that was selecting them. I do think they're really good kids, and I like them a lot, and many played as freshmen this year. So I was encouraged by that, but up to a third of them are no longer in our program, which means they didn't fit perfectly at UVA and or with our staff. And so I would, I would categorize that as transitional. In contrast to, I would say, this class would be foundational. Um, and I think that's the, the word that resonated most with me and how to describe it, meaning that we have great relationships with this class. Uh, we found most of them, and relatively early from the moment I was hired, and they understood and listened and believe in the vision of our program. Um, and with the exception of very, very few, as was the case in my previous uh, job, um, very few decommitments. These kids, once they say they're coming, they're coming and they believe wholeheartedly in the future and, and the plan that is in, in place for them. And I appreciate that trust, not only from the kids, but their parents in this day and age of um, the sensationalism and the signing day drama and what, however else you describe that, um, these kids fit really well at UVA, meaning their grades are very, very good. Um, their character is very, very good, and they're very good players. And, and here's the need that we have. We need more size, we need more strength, we need more athleticism, and we need more depth. And so this class addresses all. We have more size now, we have more strength now, we've added more athleticism, and then we add more depth. This alone will not now propel us to uh, instant gratification. This now, though, is a step in the right direction of long-term succession planning and short-term results, meaning that we're able to add a few graduate transfers in to immediately address a few needs that have to be addressed for us to function and play at the level we, will, we all want to. But what that does is it doesn't take away from the developmental plan of adding young players, because it's those, those uh, graduate kids are coming in one year they're strong students, they'll get a graduate degree from UVA, and they address a vital need for us that, um, and quite frankly, they didn't have the college experience they, they were, what, that was their ideal, and they're seeking uh, another. And so I think it could be a great thing, uh, and probably that will happen for the next couple of years. Um, offensive line, uh, it was a huge need for us this year, and so we addressed that in, again, multifaceted with grad transfers and young players. And even with the young players, there are those that are ready to play and those that are a little bit more developmental. That's not by accident. We're looking to tier um, the succession planning as, as, um, as clearly and precisely as we can. Um, Virginia will still be the first place that we recruit every single year. We want as many players from as many areas in Virginia that qualify to be at UVA and fit at UVA as possible. And that means anywhere within the state, that's where we'll go. And so roughly a third of this class um, will be represented that way. Twelve states, I think, is what we have recruits from. Plus, you can call Germany. Um, uh, we went foreign or abroad and <laughs> through um, another school. We're, we're willing to go where there are people that fit. But what I'm finding and what my staff is finding and what I'm learning, and I am still learning, is this footprint, meaning close by, um, uh, UVA, there are lots and lots and lots of players. You go within four hours driving distance, there's lots of players. You go within five, there's even more. If you go within eight hours of driving, uh, the reality that we'll have to go any farther than that once we start having the program that I think we're going to have, uh, it's probably pretty exceptional or rare that we'd be outside of that footprint. Um, and that's what I learned as well. Um, so I think we've addressed our needs short term and long term. In the next phase, foundationally, of building, not built, 
but building, and, and I expect that with the emphasis of a huge focus on a cultural development of a year ago, as that shifts more and more to playing the game of football and playing that at a higher level, I think we, we will see um, a trend upward, not only in the result, but also in the vision of what we're gonna become um, in year two. So with that, uh, uh, I think I've covered as many things as I can think of just right offhand, and so I'll take questions. And uh, I failed to mention, we do have a transcript of this afterwards, so. Uh, the class includes three running backs, two of whom enrolled this semester. You lose a lot of yards receiving and rushing with uh, Smoke and Albert. What are your expectations for the three, as well as a blocking back in, in Connor Wingo Rees, what are your expectations for the new guys and do you need them to contribute? Uh, I think that them arriving mid-year reflects our understanding that both Smoke and Albert were very good football players. Um, and really helped our team a year ago. We identified them as early as spring practices, that being one of the strengths on our team. And so not only did we feel urgency um, to replace them, uh, and, but we're, we're also doing it with youth. And so how fast we can get these youthful players out of high school now up to speed and maturing um, to even have a chance to fill those roles, it's vital um, for us. And so uh, I like the players we've signed a lot. Um, I think that gives them a chance to fill those shoes, but it would not be realistic to say now with here upperclassmen that have played so much and broken records and been, and now here come first years that now um, fill those shoes the same way or to the same level. That will take time, which means um, there'll be other parts of the offense that will have to develop besides collectively every part from a year ago, um, but that's something that reflects why we're having mid-years um, come and they wanted to come, which is, which is great. Does that answer your question? Yeah, just, uh, could you just talk about the three of them individually? Yeah. What you like about Lamont and Yeah. Um, so um, all of, uh, I'll start with all of them collectively. They're all productive. Um, and we need production not only in terms of receiving but rushing. And we need players that are capable of making plays at the ACC level and doing it consistently to help us generate more points. That has to happen. And so we're measuring these, these players not only in what our immediate needs are, but what will they be in the future and will they be good enough? So we're not only addressing it short term, we're looking long term and saying, will they be good enough in five years from now? We think they're all versatile. Um, Jamari gives us a big back that can run, much like Albert, uh, except bigger, uh, with probably um, um, abil an ability and a, a background of carrying the football more. He's very difficult to tackle, and he gives you a big back. And in single back offense, that could be a unique challenge for people. You have the chance to put him in at the same time um, as maybe Lamont or PK, and there's uh, two different types of ball carriers uh, at the same time. PK and Lamont are both capable of catching it out of the backfield well, running for power and running for speed. And so versatility is what I would say collectively about the group. Um, and I'll let their individual um, natures kind of speak for themselves as they're here over time. Brock, are you able to get to Woodbury Forest for, for three kids? Yeah. That was a, uh, a school that UVA recently hadn't gotten a whole lot from. Yeah. Was that a, a pretty big target in your mind? And going forward with a coaching change there, how do you want to keep that relationship mm. going? So, so I think Woodbury, Woodbury Forest is reflective of a type of school and a type of education and a type of football and a type of coaching that interests me. Uh, that doesn't mean exclusively, but when you think about uh, young men that, that move and travel for the sake of an amazing education, at a pretty significant cost, but then they're being coached really well and play in a league that's pretty competitive and the number of Division I players that come every year. It didn't make sense to me how that's not a UVA profile school. Great education with really good football and really high standards. And, and so it seemed like that transition would, would make complete sense. So I was intrigued by what one of our coaches went to visit first, uh, Woodbury Force, and he came back saying, man, you wait, wait till you see this place. What I found is, um, I've seen about 18 or 20 other schools similar to that. Um, and so these kids are getting, again, the parents and the families are education oriented, as are the kids, but they're also football oriented and they love the high level that they play at and they're learning autonomy and independence that prepare them for college. And so Woodbury Forest just happened to be the first and the closest that we targeted. Um, a really good quarterback in Lindell Stone, which I, there wasn't a school that I went to, even if I tried to avoid going to schools, where, where the coach wouldn't say, 
you're going to really like him. And that's unsolicited. And um, sometimes the coach of the player at the school will tell you what you want to hear. It's really fun to go place to place to place and have their rivals saying, he might be the difference. So those are the words they're using. And I'm not putting too much pressure on him, but that was fun to hear. Um, Terrell Jana at Woodbury Forest. Again, these kids are also serving kind of on their leadership council at the school. And he not only can play receiver, he can play in the secondary, and he can return kicks. So I loved all that. And plus, uh, the guy throwing to him likes him. And so <laughs> I like that. And then um, we had a player come to two of our camps in, uh, in John Curvin. And um, uh, 6'6", and now 260, and uh, he runs well. And, and our camp is more like practice than camp. I mean, he worked really, really hard, and he's tough, and he runs well. And uh, with that length and that, with that size and that work ethic, even though that needs to be some development and polishing, I love that. Again, with good grades and good students who are good football players. And so that does not mean uh, I'm interested in those schools at the exclusion of public schools. It just, what I learned is there's an amazing fit that seems seamless in transition that made sense to me. Uh, Bronco, you got five linemen coming in, high school linemen, uh, also some older players possibly. Uh, it's a developmental position. What do you like about the younger group, and what do you look for? Yeah. Physicality or, or footwork? Or so, so much. Um, we're, we're looking for ACC champ. So when I'm talking fit, we're talking about ACC championship caliber players, whether that is in their first year or by their fifth year, um, somewhere in there. That has to be something that I check that box in. And so when you see someone um, um, like Swoboda, who's 6'10 and looks like he weighs 210, but he weighs 270, um, that, it's hard to coach size. It's hard to coach length. And all of a sudden, you might have um, an NFL offensive tackle. And then when you watch him play basketball and watch him play defense and run the court, and, and, and then if you, um, if you now just simply project that as to what could that look like, I love that from a developmental perspective. When you look at like Tyler Fannin, who SEC schools were coming like furiously hard at the end, but couldn't get him because he had committed to us. Um, if you look at Chris Glasser and his, the schools that wanted him at the end, and he was committed to us. Those are now a couple type of players that um, most likely will contribute early and will have to contribute early. A player like Ryan Nelson, who's coming all the way from California, um, we had a great relationship with him early in his career, and he just he can't get enough of working with his position coach. And, and so there's a nice blend in there of um, grad transfers, immediate need, instant, pop, probably instant rotational freshmen. But then I, I like the idea of, oh, what about now staging that or stacking that to where there can be a player now that's in this class but is um, – possibly will exceed others, but it might take a little more time. And so that was all by design. And most likely, just so we're clear, another year of our offensive line will, it, this next year will look very similar in terms of building our offensive front. Similar in numbers, similar in, in who we're after, what we need. And so this program needs, uh, again, I'm using this word a lot, this succession planning idea. It's hard to be consistent if each year you're addressing immediate um, an almost um, fatal flaw kind of needs. Eventually, we'll get to the point where, oh, good, look who they have coming, and then you reload. Oh, good, look who they have coming, reload. And so we're developing while we're playing rather than reloading as we watch guys go out. And so next year's offensive front, it'll be similar in numbers and um, a makeup as it is this year. How much has recruiting changed over the last 10 years from the standpoint of the kinds of players you oh. can get? Now you got high school kids entering early, college kids graduating in three years. Uh, Vollmer, for instance, I, I under, his coach told me that he was committed to Louisville from right. the summer to, till December. How do you find out about those kids? And I guess that's part of the job, but it has to be different. It's, it's so much different. And, and really, just like I share with um, the prospects, the more intentional and specific, uh, specific you are about what you're looking for, the easier it is to find it. And so many of these younger kids, they, they start the recruiting process and everyone looks good because they don't know yet what they're looking for. Very hard to filter and frame that until they start learning and it becomes clear to them, wait, I actually have to make a decision and how am I going to do that? And the ones that don't know, 
um, they don't know what they're looking for. The ones that know early and the staffs that know early what a fit looks like for their school, easier to eliminate and find. So what's happening now, um, contrary to my belief, is everything keeps going faster, faster, faster. So I have a son that's a ninth grader. I have a son that's an eighth grader. The kids are getting offered in ninth and eighth grade, and, and the thought that I would offer one of my sons in ninth and eighth grade, I mean, I know my sons, <laughs> and I like them, right? <laughs> but it's, it's ludicrous. And, and the, the grown men managing ourselves aren't capable yet to put legislation in to say, stop it and let's get back to what will actually benefit these kids. Um, and the idea then that, uh, that the reality TV nature of signing day is now captivating to the world, um, you tell me how that now, when a player leaves college, and let's say he's not an NFL player, is, are we expecting a signing day announcement for what firm he chooses to go with? And is that now some, um, is there a hat with a different company and he's gonna, I mean, <laughs> It's doing nothing to prepare kids for reality. And we're contributing as a football society. And, and I'm not for that. And so, but yet I have to operate in that world. And so we have a guiding principle called less drama, more work. Uh, I don't know how many of my players, if you're watching it, had um, this mysterious, are they coming or not coming? That's not by accident. Um, I want players that are intentional about a great education great football with great people. And that's not something you have to decide on the last day. Um, and so that might work against me, uh, but at least I'll be with kids that I like and I want to coach. And they want to be coached by us at this place. And anyone that's contributing to the other, um, I'm not aligned with them, which is most of college football. Um, and at some point that's going to have to change because it's not preparing kids for the real world. And it's emphasizing running fast and jumping high over skills that they're going to need when they can't run fast and jump high. And that's not happening at a level that it needs to. I forgot what the question was. <laughs> but hopefully that answered it somewhere in there. Uh, Franco, you talk about succession planning and, and looking at the balance you have in this class. How do you like that and, and evaluate that? Yeah, I, I think, we, I think the, the numbers that we signed and the quality we signed fit what we were capable of in our current situation so the numbers are right on. Time will tell if the quality is right on. Um, so again, knowing that some of these players are developmental and some are we're planning to play right away. So I think, again, in relation to we need bigger, we need bigger players, we need stronger players, we need more athletic players, and I love our current team. I'm talking about in addition to them, and we need more depth. So we've addressed the depth and the size and I think the athleticism uh, in this class, but it, one class won't do it. We're going to need now, uh, we're already working on 18, which contrary to what I just said, um, if they're not pushing back, then we're moving on. Meaning, if, if, if after hearing what we have to say about UVA, if it's, ah, uh, no, <laughs> we're moving on. Um, because I want kids that want a great education with great people and ACC championship caliber football. And if they want that, yeah, let's build a relationship. Um, and if I don't think they know what they want, then I keep educating. <laughs> um, but I'm not here to entertain them. I'm not here to um, be a reality TV star. Uh, I'm here to be a teacher, a mentor, and a coach to help people have great lives. Coach, you mentioned in the opening the importance of in-state recruiting. Yes. You didn't have anyone out of, I don't believe, Richmond or the Tidewater area. Yep. I, I was wondering if you could expand a little on to. were there players there you wanted that it just didn't work out or was it a thin year for what you're looking for in those areas so so I think I think both um, let me start with the coaches that we have recruiting those areas Marcus Hagens is our recruiter in the 757 he he, he is the 757 <laughs> um, and he is UVA and so anyone that's in the 757 and wants to know what UVA is and Marcus had a unique route going through FUMA to get here amazing person amazing husband, amazing father, amazing football player, and a, a UVA graduate. And, and so he knows specifically what it takes, and I trust his opinion. And I don't, I don't think there was even a pebble that was un, un, not uncovered for him to find a player there that would fit with us. And there were some that we wanted that didn't want us. Um, same thing in Richmond with Coach Ruff. Um, and, and so the resources, I believe you put the best people on the biggest opportunities. We put great people there and uncovered, in my opinion, and did a very good job of, of seeing who might fit. 
and the ones that we wanted didn't want us. It, it takes both. And some that wanted us, we didn't want them. Um, but we'll continue to go anywhere in state um, with great emphasis and great resources to find players that um, want our program and that we want them. So this year, it didn't pan out. Um, we'll go back fast and furious and ferociously to find more um, next year. And maybe this next year reflects differently, but they will be players that fit with us athletically, academically, and socially. Um, and that's, uh, um, I think we're doing a good job of that. And Marcus, again, and Coach Ruff, if I had to, I couldn't pick two better people <laughs> to just send them out there and say, share our message. And, and if kids aren't coming to them, I'm not sure who they would come to uh, in terms of UVA ambassadorship. And on that same topic, um, I don't know if this is true or not, but do you find that 2-10 and ten has a bigger impact in-state because it's mm. closer than maybe across the country where? You know, um, I would say yes and no. Uh, it's interesting because so, so many of these kids that chose to come with us chose before the season and then kept saying after each game, can't wait to see us play again. We're getting better. We, 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 us. That's as we were struggling. And these are guys that now high school kids <laughs> Then they're not, they're not switching hats the last day. That means they were committed, a lot of them, before the season. We struggled during the year, and they're still coming. So there's a reason for that. Um, some of them are from in-state, and some are within our footprint, and some are farther away. There's still momentum that's been generated because I, I don't think there was a single kid in this class that didn't believe, even in-state, this is going to be good. Um, all that the first year did is said, oh, man, we got a lot to do, and I want to be part of it. So that's what this class said is, yeah, they're farther down than what we thought, uh, but the message and what we see and the consistency is exactly what we were told. And shoot, we might be able to help earlier than what we thought. And so that's, pre that's a pretty compelling reason as well. Um, he, he went to school in Connecticut, but how does a kid from Germany end up <laughs> coming to Virginia to play football? I don't know. Um, so we found um, uh, a young man, his teammate, Elliot Brown, and Elliot Brown uh, is a, a very good football player, as good a receiver as what we think is outside linebacker and 6'6", six, six and, um, and runs really well. I'll give you a quick story. They're on horseback at my place, and we're, we're riding in through the trees, and I learn a lot about players that haven't ridden going through the trees. And, um, and uh, while that's happening, Elliot is talking German to Garrick. And they're saying things that I don't know if they wanted me to know or not know, because I was right there. And you'd think they'd speak English if they wanted me to know, but they're speaking German and they're laughing. And and um, and so I, we started. To, I started to learn about his story and um, was placed in um, uh, uh, study abroad into West Virginia. And his story was that um, great people there, um, and I don't know how to say this but was still learning and developing and learning the game of football. And the, um, the coaches um, at the school in Connecticut saw enough potential in him to then what they call reclass, which means basically like a prep school where there's a year they're playing, but it's not counting. The, the academies do that. And so we, in, in looking for Elliot, then saw Garrick, then learned his story and then I liked him because I won't recruit someone I don't like. <laughs> and and uh, he was so much fun to be around, but also so driven. And I liked his film that he just kind of captivated us. So that was toward the end that we found him, and he just so happened to fit. And we could have easily as missed, missed him as not. And then we found out about his earlier commitment to Louisville and all that. But we found him through recruiting Elliot. And that was more, he would be an example of probably the latest we found someone and recruited and signed them as anyone in the class. Wow. And you said that about one third of last year's class will not be back. Well, um, is or, that or, ha or is already not chosen to come back okay. through the transition? Is, is, how much of that was their choice and how much of that was your choice? Man, almost all of it was at the beginning. And so I, I don't think I'm gonna add any new names. I think if you just go back and kind of trace the players that have stayed and not, um, I, I love being transparent. Um, and as much as I could, the earlier that I saw them and the earlier that they saw us with not only the schemes but sometimes the depth and sometimes just whether they liked UVA or not, whether it was what they thought it was going to be, um, about a third of that class, it, it wasn't an ideal fit for them, uh, for either one of us. And I've, I've been glad to help any that wanted to find other places. 
Uh, the good news is about two-thirds of that class we really like in terms of their fit at UVA and what they can contribute, but they also like being here. And so um, it'll be fun to watch over the next year with the class now that we've selected from beginning to end. My hope is there's, there's no attrition. That's idealistic, but to build this program the way we need to, we need consistency. And we need players to come and stay and be developed and learn our schemes, get experience, um, be understudies, then be um, role players, then be starters. So it just is the next year, it's another good UVA team. And I think it's been a while since that has happened. And, um, but that's my ideal. Uh, Bronco, I know it's not very sexy, but how hard did you uh, push to get a <laughs> kicker that you could rely on? <laughs> Um, and enough to get a kicker we rely on. <laughs> um, we saw um, our kicker. Um, so Chris Saylor runs um, these kicking camps throughout the country. I don't consider myself a kicking specialist other than I look at the yellow poles and it either goes through them or it doesn't. And when we punt it, it goes a long way or it doesn't. And, and so Chris held a camp on our campus. And... Um, it was, it was great because basically all these, the best kickers in the area and sometimes across the country came to us and they kind of travel on the circuit, the kickers. And, and Chris was um, in, or Chris Saylor's opinion, um, Brian was the best kicker um, with the most potential at our camp, starting mostly as a punter, which I love because we're losing a great punter and field position change or uh, field position swapping is still what we're gonna need for a while. But then the, the strength of his leg and accuracy improving, you now have a weapon that can add three points more frequently, even one point more frequently. And we, we need that. And so if a kicker can do both, um, that saves a scholarship that can actually go somewhere else. And Richard Burney is our long snapper who plays another position. So now we're able to take those numbers and put them and invest them in offensive and defensive um, development and depth management that can help us. And so. He, he was not only needed, he was wanted. And I think he's proven and had a chance to play in the Army All-American game, which by today's recruiting standards is a big thing. And he was one of those kickers. And so um, he might be the most highly touted in terms of credentials of anyone in the class uh, and might be the most overlooked. And kind of piggybacking on what Doug asked you earlier about the recruiting changes. Uh, there's been uh, some suggestions about an early signing period. Yes. Uh, are you in favor of that? And, and would that cut down some of the drama that you were speaking of? Man, uh, so, so I'm in favor of the early signing date that ha would happen in conjunction with the junior college signing date, which is in December. Again, because the majority of my class, and it's always been like this, um, I can't give you a percentage. I would guess 80 to 85% of my classes have always been committed before the season. That would allow them to choose or to make it official in December, um, which is just a relief for everyone, um, quite frankly, by then. And what's happening now is those kids had already chosen, others are still trying to persuade them otherwise. We're having to put more time and resources and still visiting them to protect them um, and treat them uh, like they're wanted, which they are, all the way through February when it's really not necessary. Most are ready to just move on with it. And so I think fiscally it makes sense. I think maturity-wise it makes sense. And I don't think it accelerates anything earlier than what's already in place. That's why I like that. Um, and I think it would cut down on the drama for some schools. However, there are programs um, that thrive on the drama and love the reality nature of what happens. <laughs> and, and, um, and there will still be that element but it would make it more efficient for a lot of group of five schools, um, a lot of FCS schools to go where there are still open and available players. And I think it would just clear things up and make it more efficient for, for all parties, including programs like us where the kids are, are sticking with their commitments and are gonna come no matter what. It just makes it, I don't think it takes anything away from this February date. The December date would look similar with probably less drama and February would look similar as it does now. Go, uh, Jeff, Andrew, uh, Brad, and Doug, and then wrap up. When you bring in a graduate transfer as Colin McGovern yes. in this case, is it with the expectation that he's somebody who should, if not,
compete for a starting job be in the rotation? Oh, and sure. Would you bring someone in like that if they were not going to be? I, I, I won't bring a graduate transfer in, um, and, and I'm not, uh, not mistake-proof. I mean, I might, might make a mistake, but anyone we bring as a graduate transfer is to play right now and help us fill an immediate need where we need a player and we need someone to contribute at a high level right away. And so ideally it would be a starter. If it, the, the, the lowest level I would like that to be for a grad transfer would be they're in the rotation. Um, if they come and are a backup, then I've misevaluated um, in terms of what I think they were. And they're coming to us because they see a need. I mean, I, I'm very transparent. They see a need. They're not promised anything other than a chance to compete. Um, and so I want to make that clear. None of them have been said, you come in, you're the starter. They're, they're being promised a chance to earn a spot on our team, but the need is there for us to have a starter or, or a, a rotational player as, at a minimum. To follow, with the situation, is quarterback a little different this year just because there's the gap between Kurt and the rest of the group? I, I think that's a fair point. It absolutely is because, again, there was fifth year and then first year. And, and um, while there are first-year quarterbacks, um, that can lead a team to a national championship, as in Alabama, that supporting cast was very, very strong. Um, in our particular case, while we're building that supporting cast, I've got to have time and for our program to develop players as we go. And, and, uh, and so I was not comfortable moving forward without someone, and I'm not going to d diminish that, without a very good football player who's capable of leading our team. And, and we went specifically for a player that had two years. Um, because, again, I'm looking for consistency and a program that will have a chance every year to be led well. Um, and so when, when there was a dual threat quarterback, or if we had a dual threat quarterback that has two years, um, then that, or any player, that would make more sense than a player even with one year at a position of need. You've addressed, you've talked about addressing specific needs for your program, offensive line, kicker, things like that. I don't know if there's a nose tackle that trumps out. Uh, here is that a position yeah. that you're still working on or it, it, it's one that man we we we've looked for everything possible uh, in this particular class that would fit and uh, I uh, I'm glad you brought that up there in this particular class there is not a we wanted one there wasn't a true nose that I could just now crown and just say that was the nose we were looking for to add to our program um, didn't happen and so we'll look from within our roster we have some really tough D linemen coming in that I really really like and we'll look from within our, our existing pool of who might we be able to um, convert to a nose. But that would be the one need that, um, yeah, uh, I'm, I still lose a little sleep over that. That would actually play into my question because I ask every year. You know, coaches on signing day always say they love their kids, they love their class, they feel needs. I'm always curious, like, what, what areas you feel like you didn't hit? Where did, mm -hmm. you, where did you feel like you missed? And in this class, I guess, nose tackle was one. Where, where were some other areas you feel like you didn't, you didn't get home on? Uh, um, what, would have loved um, one more uh, dynamic receiver uh, for this group. Now, we have some pretty cool options because we have um, a really, really good uh, outside linebacker um, in Snowden, who is 6'7", and plays receiver as well and is a matchup nightmare for I don't know of any corners that are six seven. Um, but he might be able to. I'm not giving him up but I'm not declaring he's a receiver. So let's he's an outside linebacker, okay? That's just what I was gonna say. And so Brown as well and so and then Terrell Jana, um, there's three kids, but if I were to say that that, that could go either or but I would have liked one more um, we have a, a we wanted speed at wideout too, and uh, Pratt might be the fastest 200 meter runner in high school this year. Uh, he he'll, according to our track coaches, they think he'll be 20 point um, low, 20 point whatever low is in the 20 points. But um, so we've added some speed there. We wanted one more uh, if it's our deal, and I want to make it clear. Yeah, I love this class, but I hope I frame this in the context of addressing size, uh, strength, speed, athleticism, and depth. Uh, in relation to our needs. And it's going to take more than one class to do this. And so I do love them. I love them because they honored their commitments. They're good students, they're good players, and they're good people. Um, now, how good they play and how good and how fast they help us, let's be realistic. That'll manifest over time. Um, but I think they have great potential. We'll uh, let Doug have our last question here. Virginia's had a lot of very good players from 
fork union over mm. the years. You mentioned the, the relationship you're building with Woodbury Forest. What do you see with uh, yeah. Fork Union? Is that doable? I know yes. Bratton was committed basically before you got here. So, uh, yeah, and I had my first visit to Fork Union, so I, I like that question as well because it helps f keep framing philosophy. It's a great place for, for us to see if a player will demonstrate the desire and the capability to be developed. Sometimes someone needs development, they don't want to be developed <laughs> and grow and learn. And so I've used Marcus, Coach Higgins as an example, but Darius Bratton, um, to hear his coaches and to see him play, but also my, my uh, personal relationship with him, he's a great fit for UVA, in my opinion. And I, wouldn't, I didn't know that for sure as I first arrived, but the time that he was there and, the time that, and what I've seen from him, that just qualified him to be with us. And not just where I'm taking him, I want him. And so I'm anxious for players that might not have had um, uh, the exact experience they wanted in high school, or possibly they've struggled with the test, but have had good grades and are and academically capable to go and, and show that they belong at UVA. And, and so I think that's a viable option, and, a, and I'd like to foster that relationship uh, moving forward.